Dr. Samuel Noble holds a Ph.D. in Religious Studies from KU Leuven, and he also is a visiting researcher at the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations at Aga Khan University in London, and today he's joining us from Brussels. So thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Noble. Thank you for having me. So let's start with the Council of Chalcedon itself. For some of our non-theological, non-seminary trained uh, viewers, tell us what was decided at Chalcedon and why is that important to us today? Doctrinally speaking, uh, the Council of Chalcedon is part of the whole series of ecumenical councils that are, uh, from various perspectives and various ways, uh, attempting to answer the question of, uh, well, who is Jesus Christ? And the important part for the Council of Chalcedon is to explain how Christ uh, in the Incarnation is both consubstantial with uh, the Godhead, with the Trinity, and consubstantial with humankind, uh, having taken on our human nature. And so the language that Chalcedon establishes to explain this is to speak of Christ as one person, that is one hypostasis or prosopon, uh, who exists out of and in two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. And these two natures exist uh, in Christ without confusion, change, division, or separation. That is, he, he is truly God and truly human. His humanity is not compromised. His uh, consubstantiality with us is not compromised. And his uh, consubstantiality with the Trinity is not compromised. He does not become less God, and he does not compromise his humanness in the Incarnation. Uh, and so that's why this language of two natures continuing in Christ uh, in the Incarnation is so important. Now, there are a couple other important things that Chalcedon did that are so we, you could think of maybe somewhere in between political and uh, theological. And uh, that is that Chalcedon uh, brought together theological languages which was acceptable in different parts of the Roman world. That is, it, it was not imposing the language of a single uh, power center. Instead, it you uh, used language that was acceptable to Rome uh, in the form of uh, accepting the tome issued by Pope Leo. Uh, and it was also uh, using language that was acceptable to the Syrians, that is, this language of it, two natures. But on all of this, it, in all of this, it was uh, subjecting this varied theological language to a hermeneutic that comes uh, from St. Cyril of Alexandria. And this can be seen in the Acts of the Council, where the Tome of Leo is read, and then there's some discussion and some doubts about it, and it's analyzed uh, on the basis of its conformity with uh, Cyril's theological vision, and at the end they proclaim, you know, this is the faith of Cyril. And so there's a variety of languages uh, that it's possible to use, but it's uh, also canonizing the theological um, understanding or the theological vision of St. Cyril. Well, and that's interesting because St. Cyril is revered as a saint and church father by both the Oriental and Eastern Orthodox families. So how did the uh, either or both misunderstand what St. Cyril, because they both can't be right, can they? Well, uh, I mean, that's uh, that comes down to the question of what uh, non-Chalcedonians actually believe in practice, which is a very, uh, quite difficult question, in, in fact, and one that's better to hear from them, I think, than from me, perhaps. But... For the non-Chalcedonian perspective, there's a very, very strong insistence on uh, canonizing a single phrase 
of Cyril, that is, one incarnate nature of God the Word. And this, while it's turned into a slogan very early on by uh, opponents of Chalcedon, it it's not necessarily programmatic of Cyril's own theology. And, you know, Cyril speaks of, and even non-Chalcedonians speak of two usie in Christ, you know, a divinity and a humanity. But it's an, an insistence on a very, very narrow um, use of his language that uh, they see as loyalty to Cyril. Whereas from the Chalcedonian side, there's uh, a flexibility with language in that um, not only, it, well, this phrase, one incarnate nature of God, the word, uh, is uh, the Fifth Ecumenical Council declared to be acceptable if it's understood in a proper way, but unacceptable if it's understood wrongly, like any phrase. Well, the ironic thing, of course, is that St. Cyril of Alexandria is revered as a saint and church father by both the Oriental Orthodox and the Eastern Orthodox. So it kind of makes a layman like myself wonder, well, who misunderstood him? They can't both be right, can they? Well, a lot of that depends on uh, the question of what specifically non-Chalcedonians understand uh, St. Cyril to have meant and what they understand sort of the Christological model to be. And that's a that's a complicated question uh, because it's not necessarily been canonized by them in later councils in the same way that the Chalcedonian side uh, continued to, um, well, discuss Christological language and rule out certain misunderstandings that could be uh, made. Now, on the non-Chalcedonian side, though, there is a very strong rigidity of language that you don't see on the Chalcedonian side. So for them, from the very beginning in, in reacting to Chalcedon, there is sort of the uh, canonization of a phrase from uh, St. Cyril as a kind of slogan and total uh, theological touchstone, which is one incarnate nature of God, the Word. Now, this can be understood to mean all kinds of different things. Um, and in the uh, at the Fifth Ecumenical Council in 553, the Chalcedonian side uh, took up discussing how this can properly be understood. Um, but um, the Chalcedonian side in general wasn't so much concerned with uh, adopting all of Cyril's language, and he had a very, you know, various usages of language over his large corpus. So to sort of zero in on a phrase the way the non-Chalcedonians did is uh, a little bit cherry picking. But from the Chalcedonian side, they don't just look at the most polemical language that Cyril used, and Cyril was quite a polemicist. Um, they also look at the language that he found acceptable when reconciling with the Antiochian party. Um, and so the uh, um, active union that took place after the First Council of Ephesus, that is, so at the First Council of Ephesus in 431, uh, where, where Cyril was more or less in total control, he, uh, well, condemns Nestorius, and uh, of course the uh, phrase Theotokos is canonized as proper theological language, but he also completely marginalizes the Patriarchate of Antioch, the Syrians, during uh, the way that he held this council, to the point where the uh, Syrians completely uh, did not accept the council and uh, held their own sort of counter council uh, at the same time. And so it was only two years later, in 433, where a reconciliation was made. And there's a, a formula of reunion that was uh, made between the um, Syrians and Cyril, where uh, it stated that Christ is consubstantial with the Father and Godhead, and consubstantial with us in humanity, for a union of two natures took place. You know, it, it doesn't go so as far as Chalcedon in saying that uh, in this union of two natures, the two natures continue. But it's already really implicitly there, because if the two natures cease to exist or change or 
melt into one nature from uh, the perspective of the Syrians, this would um, mo- imply a division of or a, uh, the humanity dissolving away or, I mean, even worse, the divinity dissolving away. Um, but my point here is not so much that as it's that the Chalcedonian perspective wants to look at the conciliatory side of Cyril as well, and not to look at uh, language used that would exclude other parties. Um, and that becomes very important. Uh, the non-Chalcedonians, on the other hand, also uh, have as one of their chief saints and heroes, Cyril's successor, Dioscorus. Mm-hmm. And Dioscorus did roughly the opposite of this, that um, he attempted in the the robber synod, the second council of Ephesus in uh, um, 448, uh, he basically attempted to canonize the most uncompromising statements that Cyril made, uh, while also marginalizing every single other party. So not only does he depose the... Uh, Archbishop of Constantinople, Flavian, uh, and sent him into exile, where he immediately dies. Uh, but he uh, deposed the Patriarch of Antioch, and he ran off the papal legates, who, uh, in the contemporary accounts, seem to have felt like they made it out, uh, you know, with only their skin intact, because uh, Dioscorus was using... Uh, well, armed monks to enforce his decisions. And so there's a real contrast here between Chalcedon and uh, the Second Council of Ephesus in that Chalcedon emphasizes meaning and bringing together different theological traditions, different power centers um, throughout the empire, while the earliest sort of anti-Chalcedonian, so Dioscorus, uh, emphasizes trying to have uh, Alexandria triumph uh, not only theologically but politically over everyone else, okay. and uh, which obviously is unworkable. Yeah, in, in case someone is wondering, like I was, why didn't uh, St. Cyril just fix this at the Council of Chalcedon? He'd actually reposed just a few years earlier, is that right? Exactly. So uh, Cyril uh, reposes in the year 444. And um, so it's, uh, so his type of very, very, on the one sense, theologically uncompromising, um, but politically very astute and uh, conciliatory in the right moments type of personality did not exist in the decades following. And in fact, the, his, the people who saw themselves as his uh, theological and political heirs, so Dioscorus and Eutyches, um, had none of, uh, had basically all of his vices and none of his virtues. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and so as often is the case, there are, is a lot of political intrigue and turmoil that surrounds theological discussions and attempts at conciliarity. Are there other political factors that played a role in the separation between the Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox families? Well, so there's a whole set of sort of rivalries that are emerging at this time. The oldest rivalry, and theologically the most important, is between Antioch and uh, Alexandria, where there's two separate exegetical uh, tendencies, where uh, Alexandria is very, very concerned with emphasizing the unity of Christ, while the Antiochian tradition is very... uh, well, it seems very important to emphasize the reality of Christ's humanity uh, simultaneous to the reality of his divinity. And uh, this leads, obviously, to two kind of separate languages um, that are reconciled in Chalcedon, where the hypostasis 
uh, ensures the unity of Christ's person, while the two different natures ensures the um, reality of the humanity and the divinity in Christ. Uh, but in addition to that, there's the emergence of Constantinople as an ecclesiastical power center rather than simply the center of the, of the empire. Uh, that is, you know, famously. Um, in Canon 28, the Archbishop of Constantinople is placed as being equal to um, the Pope of Rome. In, and uh, so he's sort of uh, this church whose importance is derived from its closeness to the uh, emperor is leapfrogging very old uh apostolic Petrine churches like Antioch and Alexandria. And this is also causing tension, uh, not only causing tension between Constantinople and uh, Rome, but also Constantinople and Antioch and uh, Alexandria. At each of these councils, if we start with Ephesus going through Chalcedon, there's uh, sort of a different array of sees and emperor lining up against each other in different ways. So at Ephesus, uh, first Ephesus, uh, one of the chief reasons that Cyril is so successful is that he's able to uh, basically secure the agreement of Pope Celestine. And so between the support of the papacy and the support of the emperor, he's able to um, successfully uh, kind of marginalize the Patriarchate of Antioch. Now, then at uh, the Second Council of Ephesus, it's sort of the opposite, and the attempt of uh, Dioscorus to marginalize everyone uh, fails politically, uh, kind of completely falls flat on its face. While uh, at Chalcedon, it's, it, it winds up again being everyone versus Dioscorus, who attends at the beginning and then... Um, refuses to attend and is, uh, in fact, condemned by the council, not on any doctrinal basis, but simply for his uh, refusal to uh, obey a summons to ascend the, the later sessions of the council. And so it, in a sense, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of political rivalries at play, but we see also an important aspect of the conciliar nature of the church, and that's no one see can ever really get away with uh, dictating itself to the other churches in the Orthodox conciliar system when it properly functions. And this is what we have happening uh, both at uh, the First Council of Ephesus and at Chalcedon, but not at the Second Council of Ephesus. Okay, so one of our panelists, who's a scholar in the Coptic Church, said that Chalcedon basically undid what Ephesus, the Third Ecumenical Council, accomplished. I'm pretty sure you don't agree with that, but can you understand why he may have made such a statement? Well, that's certainly the perspective of uh, Dioscorus's party. And we, we can see maybe uh, what he's getting at by how the Second Council of Ephesus understood uh, what it was doing. The Second Council of Ephesus is very careful not to issue a new uh, doctrinal statement in the way that Chalcedon did, um, or would go on to do, rather, uh, to keep our chronology straight. But in, instead, it simply says that the Council of uh, Nicaea and the Council of Ephesus are sufficient for talking about Christology. This was, in fact, also the position of uh, Eutyches when he attempted to defend himself, was he claimed that there should be no further statements of Christology, that his position is the position of uh, Cyril, which is the position simply of the Council of Ephesus. And for um, clarification, Eutyches, he basically uh, was saying that Christ's uh, divinity swallowed up his humanity? Is that... Accurate. Well, that's that's certainly how everyone took him to me, and we we don't have we don't have good enough accounts of what he was saying before he was trying to defend himself to know if he was saying that in in as many words. But 
he becomes a uh, sort of a, a um, metonymy for the idea that, yeah, the divinity swallows up the humanity and that there is only one nature in Christ and that is divine. Um, importantly, uh, modern uh, non Chalcedonians are, unlike Dioscorus, uh, happy to condemn him and to say that he, he was incorrect. And so he's not a theological hero for the non Chalcedonians. Uh, but he is definitely part of the same tradition as Dioscorus of uh, emphasizing, in an exaggerated way, certain elements of Cyril's language. Okay, so if I understand then, um, non-Chalcedonians are basically trying to protect what was established in the first three ecumenical councils, that Christ is fully God and fully man. They hear language like two natures and wonder to themselves whether there is a retreat from the fully God and fully man uh, emphasis of the first three ecumenical councils. Um, and as Chalcedonians, we're saying, no, uh, there is no retreat whatsoever from that. We are further trying to address a problem. And so what was that problem that Chalcedon or Chalcedon was trying to address? Well, the, the problem was, uh, in, in effect, uh, Eutyches. But in, in uh, the... Theological problem that Chalcedon is trying to address is trying to make it as unambiguously clear as possible that Christ remains human in the incarnation, in addition to being divine. And so, if you if you use one nature language, it becomes quite easy to uh, make it either that you have a um, uh, well, either the divinity swallows up the humanity, or they're synthesized together in a sort of tertium quid that's neither wholly human nor wholly uh, divine. And so Chalcedon's two-nature language seeks to prevent either of these types of confusions. Um, and so in that sense, it's uh, it, it secures a Cyrillian Christology. Um, in, in a more workable way than one nature language uh, is capable of doing. Makes sense. Thank you. So the division happens. Chalcedon is rejected, but I'm sure that it wasn't just one day they were in, the next day they were out. What happened in subsequent years to attempt to get a better understanding that, no, 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 we don't mean that, we mean this on both sides? Uh, and how long did that take? Well, it's extremely complicated, we can say, because a lot of these things depend on which emperor is in power. And so you have emperors or, uh, well, in some cases, emperors' wives favoring one side or the other um, and deposing bishops and installing bishops. And you have, uh, on the non-Chalcedonian side, a tremendous amount of disagreement as uh, to what they actually believe substantially. That is, uh, among people who are opposed to two-nature language, you have a great many different possible uh, theologies that can still be constructed using one-nature language. And so um, what you have is, well, a, a, a bit of a free-for-all and a lot of uh, political and theological chaos in the Near Eastern parts of the uh, Roman Empire, basically until the arrival of Islam. Um, and so the on the non-Calcedonian side, one of the important things is to remember is that the relatively most moderate party won out. Um, that is the party that uh, sort of congealed around Severus of Antioch's theology. And if we look at other possible uh, theologies, we can see sort of some of the problems that 
emerge from uh, one nature language. So, for example, if uh, you believe that nature is individual, that nature has to correspond to uh, hypostases in number, then you have the problem of, well, does that mean that each of the members of the Trinity have their own nature? And in fact, one of the most influential philosophers of um, the post calcedonian period, John Philoponus, did uh, advocated just that, and his followers were called the Tritheists, and uh, were, in fact, well, quite influential, basically until, um, well, the consolidation of uh, non-Chalcedonian churches, a single non-Chalcedonian church in Syria, uh, around the time of the arrival of Islam. Uh, you also have, on the Chalcedonian side, sustained attempts uh, by various emperors at either coming up with compromises or coming up with discussions that uh, with non-Chalcedonian leadership. In short, it came to be clear by the early 6th century that you can't, you couldn't go back on Chalcedon. You couldn't have a compromise that said, okay, no discussion of mm -hmm. natures at all, uh, because that would, well, make it very, very difficult to talk about, um, well, what Christ is doing in the Bible. Because have to remember, this is about biblical exegesis. Yes. And you, you can't, if you take away the, the possibility of talking about, you know, humanity and divinity, um, human and divine natures, then that, well, makes it very impossible, uh, very difficult to do, say anything meaningful about the faith. Um, and so it became impossible politically to, uh, or both politically and theologically, to uh, step back from the language established at Chalcedon. But what did happen in a positive sense was that there were further councils that uh, tried to address non-Chalcedonian concerns. That is, especially uh, the uh, Fifth Ecumenical Council, the uh, uh, Council of Constantinople of 553, uh, that had followed a long series of attempts by Justinian to bring the anti-Chalcedonians back within the umbrella of the imperial church. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he he had sustained uh, discussions with Severus of Antioch himself. There were all these attempts to talk it through. And while the talks themselves obviously failed, uh, a council was held that, well, basically ruled out any ambiguity of the type that non-Chalcedonians are concerned about. Non-Chalcedonians see two natures uh, as basically meaning two subjects, mm -hmm. two, two sons. They basically see it as Nestorianism. Yeah. And the Fifth Ecumenical Council made it very, very clear that there is a single subject of the Incarnation, uh, that is God the Word, who becomes human while remaining God, and that there's not... That this that a nature in Chalcedonian language is not a, a, a sub a, a substantive thing. It doesn't mean an, a a human. It means humanity, humanness, what's shared by all of us. And this was made unambiguously clear in five fifty three. And so there was there was always a willingness, um, even if it became impossible to step back from Chalcedonian language. There was always a willingness to explain what was meant. But obviously, uh, and it, it because, didn't work, right? <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I obviously, it didn't work because um, from the time of Dioscorus, there was an insistence that only certain language used by Cyril was acceptable, and this was the impetus for rejection of Chalcedon and rejection of any sort of um, can, uh, attempts at explain, explaining the theology underlying Chalcedon. Got it. Very interesting. So. Before we move into modern day times and dialogues, etc., were there, I'm assuming, there were anathemas that were declared and heretics were identified on both sides. Has any of that been lifted uh, since? Right. So on the non-Chalcedonian side, they 
uh, they anathematized Pope Leo and his tome, uh, as well as various other figures, but Leo was really perhaps the most important here. On the Chalcedonian side, this happened gradually. And so at first, at the Council of Chalcedon, uh, Dioscorus was deposed for not obeying a summons to appear at the council. And that is, he was disobeying an imperial edict, and obviously he, he couldn't continue to be a bishop um, while breaking the law in this way. But he was not anathematized yet. Uh, that will change at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, uh, where the uh, so the uh, third uh, Council of Constantinople in the seventh century, where both Dioscorus and Severus of Antioch are anathematized. Now, um, talking about lifting of anathemas is quite delicate because, okay, so there's the 20th century example of um, uh, the ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras lifting the anathema of uh, the Pope of Rome. That, but that he's lifting an anathema that was made personally by a previous ecumenical patriarch in the 11th century. And so it's, it's being done with equal authority. But when you have anathemas that were issued by an ecumenical council, um, whether or not that could be um, revoked, in, canonically speaking, uh, is already a delicate question, but there's no doubt that what would be necessary, uh, if it is possible, would be for an ecumenical council itself to, to revoke such an anathema. Well, so here we are some 1,500 years later, and as theologians on both sides look at the theological differences and begin to dialogue about them, as I understand there has been some dialogue in recent uh, decades, is there any sense that we actually mean the same thing about the nature of Christ, that perhaps the words were different, but the meaning was essentially the same? So... This is a, actually a question that, even as, as you formulate it, is, is this just about words? That it's, this is a question that has been raised for centuries. So, uh, for example, just because it's on the top of my mind right now, I've been working through the writings of a really important but neglected figure from 18th century Egypt, who's a priest and theologian named Masad Nashu. And he was a relentless polemicist against Tridentine Roman Catholicism. Uh, but we uh, have a text where a parishioner of his asks him, uh, well, what's the difference with Copts? And, you know, and this is a very important social question for Gastonians in Egypt in the 18th century, because they were a very small part of the, uh, well, Christian community there around many, many Copts. So Masad Neshu begins his response by saying that, unlike with the Latins, with the Copts, there's really only one issue. And here I'll quote it because I have it in front of me. Is He says, the issue is something that from one perspective we could say is nothing at all, but from another perspective it is very great. For the reason someone has said, for this reason someone has said that the difference between us and them is a dispute only over words and expression. So then he goes on to explain that, like the Chalcedonians, the Copts anathematize both Eutyches and Nestorius, and like the Chalcedonians, they believe that Christ's divinity and humanity exist without mixing confusion or, or change. And so he uh, attributes the Copts' insistence that Chalcedonian theology was unacceptable to the poor level of education among the Copts in his day. Now, that's kind of patronizing, obviously. Uh, although it's accurate, I think, about it, uh, the st uh, state of the Coptic Church in the 18th century. But what's interesting is that he didn't leave it there. He went on to translate the full corpus of Athanasius of Alexandria into Arabic for the benefit, it's put in the introduction, for the benefit of, he says, all Christians. But what that means is for the benefit of the Coptic Church. So, and actually all our manuscripts of his translations exist only in Coptic libraries and uh, not in um, uh, Orthodox li or Chalcedonian Orthodox libraries. But so uh, even when you say it's all a difference in terms, 
that has to be taken seriously. And if you take Masad Nashu's position, it's basically a call to action and a call to sort of mutually read the fathers, uh, well, that we both recognize. And Athanasius was obviously a very good choice for this because he's not only a great Alexandrian father, uh, but he has quite a lot to say about the incarnation. All that said, the important thing when when talking about the non-Chalcedonians is to uh, take or, or to be aware of these things that Masad Nashu said, that, or you know that when many other people say in modern dialogue say that is both the, uh, the Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians they reject Eutyches and Nestorius. That is, they're in agreement that the uh, that Christ incarnate is cons consubstantial with God and consubstantial with us and remains a single subject. Uh, the problem is about what is understood by the term nature. And this, I mean, I, I don't know how you would explain the difference between a, uh, a, a difference that's just in words or a difference that's uh, really profoundly philosophical, because I think this the, the difference in how nature gets used in people who use one nature language and people who use two nature languages or, uh, is there's quite a big philosophical difference. And this was historically um, always recognized in the polemics. I mean, you get some quite poor Chalcedonian polemics against non Chalcedonians and say, oh, no, they just agree with Eutyches. But that's not the mainstream certainly of Chalcedonian discourse about non-Chalcedonians. The discourse centers on the difference in this understanding of natures. So for Chalcedonians, nature is something that is common. That is, the same human nature is shared by all humans, just as the same divine nature is shared by the persons of the Trinity. Christ is unique, of course, because although he's from eternity consubstantial with the Trinity, he took our shared human nature. So you have a single subject that uh, takes on these two, or that always had a divine nature, but takes on a sh the shared human nature. He shares the same human nature as us. For non-Chalcedonians, though, it's possible to talk about individual nature. And when you read Chalcedonian fathers, such as John of Damascus or Maximus the Confessor, this is the real sticking point. Uh, you cannot have an individual nature. You cannot have one person having a different human nature than another person. Nature is shared. So, so but for the non-Chalcedonians, uh, humanity and divinity are combined into a single compound nature. That is, uh, in contrast to where Chalcedonians talk about a single compound hypostasis sharing two natures. From the Chalcedonian perspective, to talk about a single nature that combines both, or that is both human and divine, there's, there's several problems that need to be cleared up. In this formulation, it's less clear how Christ shares natures with both the Trinity and with humankind. Using uh, such a language, is Christ consubstantial with both? Uh, or has he become a sort of tertium quid? Is he a third thing by having a nature uh, that's not the same as the human or divine natures? This is a common line in Chalcedonian polemic um, mm. among Chalcedonian fathers. Uh, the other line of questioning is, is the human nature that Christ took on something that he shares with us, or did he take on an individual? Because if you say that natures are individual, then Christ is taking on in the incarnation an individual, not taking a, um, well, something that's common into his person. And if it is the case that Christ took on an individual, that is, that Christ assumed a man rather than assuming the common human nature, then from a Chalcedonian perspective, this is basically bending back to, around to Nestorianism. And this was the classical Chalcedonian polemical point, that non-Chalcedonians and Nestorians start with the same flawed understanding of nature by say, associating it with the individual rather than with the common. And they just take that error in different directions.
So I think that it's there's lots of precedent for saying that the main difference is linguistic, if we accept that this is or what that is meant, is that it's a different um, philosophical background. And it's a very, very different understanding of what nature is. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. So within the non-Chalcedonian camp, uh, and I realize we're just guessing here, but are there notable differences between the theologians or spokespersons uh, of the various non-Chalcedonian uh, churches and traditions that where they don't agree with each other? Well, historically, certainly. There were a great number of different Christologies to be found among non-Chalcedonians. And in the period between Chalcedon and the arrival of the Muslims into the Levant in Egypt, there were many factions kind of warring it out with each other more than they were warring with the imperial church. Uh, one prominent camp that's historically very important was led by the philosopher John Philoponus. And he took the concept of individual natures to its logical conclusion and claimed that the persons of the Trinity do indeed have separate natures. And so his followers uh, were called tritheists, and they eventually uh, die out after Islam. But um, the party that won out among the non-Chalcedonians was that of, uh, as I mentioned, Severus of Antioch. Uh, and he took a much more moderate uh, position while still insisting that nature is personal. So he says, he polemicizes with the uh, tritheists and says, no, no, this is absolutely ridiculous. But he still insists on a personal understanding of nature. And for the purposes of the various theological dialogues in modern times, so whether it's with the Chalcedonian Orthodox or with Roman Catholics, the non Chalcedonian theology that's being talked about is, for all intents and purposes, that of severance. Now, that said, uh, it's very hard to know how Christology is discussed across Arabic, Syriac, Armenian, Amharic, Malayalam. Hmm. Uh, you know, no one can reasonably be expected to master all these languages and discourses and literatures. And so there is the problem that in dialogues, everything sort of gets flattened into academic English. Um, so I, I, I don't, I, I think that's a, an important question that everyone, including non Castellians themselves, uh, find ways to make it, or it possible to be more familiar with uh, the theological lives of these very, very diverse churches. Um, but I'll say that we can speaking historically, and my own expertise is just in Arabic. Well, it was in Syriac, I suppose, and um, just in the Middle Ages. But from what I've seen reading medieval texts, when you insist really strongly on a verbal formulation, uh, that is, when you insist on the slogan of one incarnate nature of God, the Word, you can create all kinds of different theological uh, theologies that uh, still hold to that same verbal formulation. So one of our goals, uh, Dr. Noble, in this documentary is to help people like me, frankly, who are not seminary trained, not scholastic, we're lay people, we love the church, we want unity. And so we hear a lot of terms, and they're sometimes confusing. We kind of get what happened at the 451 Council. We certainly understand that Christ was fully God and fully man. But then we hear these other terms, and I wonder if you could help us with terms such as monophysite or monophysite, whatever way should be pronounced. Miaphysite is another term that I've heard. And then uh, a little bit later, uh, as it relates, I think I've heard with uh, St. Maximus the Confessor, monothelitism. So can you uh, unpack those for us? Okay, so monophysite, and I use I mean, I very freely in how I pronounce it, it doesn't really matter, <laughs> yeah, uh, better. is literally, it simply means one nature. Now, and so it's been historically applied, both in Greek and in Western languages, to any theology that uses one nature. It, for one reason or another, among non-Chalcedonians, there is a strong feeling that that term means only Eutyches' theology. 
uh, that's historically not true, but they, but you know, but in many sort of popular representations and in less educated uh, Chalcedonian texts, that it's usually or it, it was quite common to say, okay, well, um, a monophysite is someone who believes that Christ only has a divine nature. Now, that's not that's not the intention of the term or how the term is historically used by educated. Uh, Okay. People. Uh, but in order to sort of emphasize the fact that that's not at all what non Chalcedonians believe, uh, in the, well, late 20th century, I think the 1970s, uh, and I think it was by the great Syriac scholar Sebastian Brock, uh, a term was coined to make that distinction and say, uh, Miaphysite. Uh, the problem with and so that is a term that's designed to be a neutral term to talk about people who use one nature language uh, that avoids any confusion with um, Eutyches's theology. Uh, the problem with it is that it's kind of a barbarism in Greek. You can't actually when you say one nature when you say one of something as a prefix you use mono. And you can't use Mia as a, um, which is the feminine form of one, for uh, meaning one in a, a Greek compound word. So it's so if you're sensitive to good Greek, it sounds terrible, and some people uh, refuse to use it on those grounds. But I think, by and large, anyone now using the term monophysite is, or should be educated enough to know that this is not an accusation of uh, Eutychianism, that it's simply a way of saying one uh, nature language. Now, monothelitism is uh, sort of a different can of worms. It uh, Basically, it means uh, the belief that uh, th there is one will in Christ. And this can is historically applied to a couple different things. One is the attempt by the Roman emperor Heraclius to uh, try to create a compromise by saying, okay, Christ has two natures, but one will, and that one will secures the um, unity of Christ. This, you know, it was purely promoted very briefly, uh, but it uh well created a great deal of controversy because it was opposed uh by maximus the confessor and the monks um in the monasteries of uh palestine and well at times by rome uh and eventually was condemned at the sixth ecumenical council uh however it also could be applied to uh, the theological language that was very common across all of the non, uh, uh, well, not just the non-Chalcedonian churches, but the churches in the Near East in general. In both Nestorian or the Church of the East's theological language, in the non-Chalcedonian theological language, and among a lot of Chalcedonians in Syria, there was a kind of non-reflective uh, use of one will language to talk about Christ. And this kind of not theologically developed uh, form or, or of Chalcedonian monothelitism uh, eventually gave birth to the Maronite Church in Lebanon, which, upon its uh, joining with Rome during the Crusades, uh, gave up on this type of language and now pretends like they never used it. Hmm. Um, but the issue where it applies to talking about relations with the non Chalcedonians is that non-Chalcedonians are quite insistent on using single uh, will and single activity language uh, when talking about Christ. So is this what St. Maximus, the confessor, lost his tongue over? Yeah, exactly. exactly. And, in, and in the Middle East, in uh, the early Islamic period, uh, what are now the Orthodox uh, were called Maximians. Hmm. And they were probably a minority relative to the Maronites until about the eighth, or until some point in the eighth century, um, because it was it's quite a 
it, it requires quite a lot of unpacking to explain how natural wills or two different natural wills in Christ uh, does not mean a kind of split personality. And the rejection of it among, uh, well, early Maronite texts is very unsophisticated and in insisting basically, well, you can't say two wills because the um, well, that would mean a personality disagreeing with it, and that would create kind of a schizophrenic Christ. And so, yeah, it's it quite a lot of unpacking for people to accept um, Maximus's technical language. Got it. So I have, uh, in modern day, do you notice a difference in how uh, Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian churches relate to each other in different parts of the world, say the Middle East as compared to uh, here in North America? And if so, why, why is that? Um, well, it's been quite a while since I've uh, lived in North America, but in the Middle East is where there have been attempts at um, the practical implementation of joint agreements between local non-Chalcedonian and Chalcedonian churches. Uh, the, in 1991, there was a very, very sweeping uh, agreement that was made between the uh, Chalcedonian Rome Orthodox Church of Antioch and the Syrian uh, Church of Antioch, uh, that envisioned things even going so far as having uh, liturgical concelebration. Now, that, that agreement still exists on paper, but it really was never implemented in any practical way. And I think it, it was sort of swept under the table after it received some degree of uh, pushback from other local churches as well as uh, kind of a realization that's probably practically unfeasible at the time. Uh, in addition to that, in 2001, there was an agreement in the between the Greek Orthodox and Coptic churches of Alexandria to recognize each other's wedding ceremonies. Now, this I don't think is any different from the practice among most Orthodox churches in North America, though perhaps correct me. Uh, but it was very important in Egypt one, to rule out any chance of concelebration, uh, because to make it not necessary, and because in Egypt, just like in most uh, countries of the Middle East, uh, religious authorities control civil status, uh, not civil authorities. So there's no civil marriage, and so you have to get married with a church authority if you're a Christian. Um, so that was sorted out. But in practice, especially in Syria and Lebanon, it's Questions of inter-Christian relations aren't just between Chalcedonians and mountain Chalcedonians. It's also the various uh, Catholic churches. And there's such a high degree of intermarriage, in Syria and Lebanon at least, that there is an enormous amount of informal uh, intercommunion. Mm. And this is simply a practical reality because it, almost all Christian families are mixed. And solving that pastorally in a theologically satisfying way is more or less impossible. Mm. Uh, that type of mixed marriage, or that, that rate of mixed marriage, I don't get the impression is the case among uh, most communities in North America, though I'm not sure. And so it's, it's a different pastoral reality, mm -hmm. uh, for That's sure. Yeah. Very interesting. So we can see some pastoral sensitivity applied uh, in that part of the world. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the Oriental Orthodox liturgies and services. Uh, are they theologically acceptable as they exist to Chalcedonian churches? And I guess what we're getting at is, did they serve these services when we were one church? Were they, were they the same as they are today? And if they wouldn't be acceptable today, why not? Well... As I uh, mentioned earlier, there's a huge amount of liturgical variation among the non-Chalcedonian churches. Uh, so if we're talking about the Coptic and the Syriac uh, churches, uh, the Copts use the liturgy of St. Mark, the sort of the Alexandrian Egyptian uh, tradition from the earliest times. And the Syriacs use uh, the liturgy of St. James, sort of the liturgy of um, 
the Levant, from which the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom uh, evolved. Mm -hmm. But it would be wrong to say that these uh, liturgies are completely static in time. I mean, they're they're very conservative, just like our liturgy, and they they are they're not too prone to changing. But um, the Syriacs, especially, have had a long tradition of uh, composing new hymnography, and I mean, they have probably the richest corpus of uh, pre-modern Christian hymnography of anyone. And they also, um, in the 10th, 11th centuries, borrowed a huge amount of uh, Chalcedonian hymnography that they translated from Greek. Uh, so you even have uh, canons by John of Damascus translated into Syriac that can be used in their liturgy. Um, and you have, unlike almost all the other churches, among the Syriacs, uh, almost every patriarch historically wrote his own anaphora. Mm. And so there's uh, a huge amount of, um, well, variety of texts among the uh, Syriacs. Uh, but theologically, no. I mean, it, the, what they're doing in a liturgy, if we're just talking about the Copts and the Syriacs, is quite intuitive to someone who's familiar with the Chalcedonian Orthodox liturgy. Mm. It's I, I spent some weeks well, when I was much younger uh, in Torah Abdin in the monasteries there, and it's it, it's not it's not difficult to um, understand what's going on, and it's not difficult to sort of fall into the rhythm of their prayer life because it's very very similar to ours. Mm. Um, and so, yes, yeah, certainly we have in our um, you know, we have Treparia to saints that are, uh, well, that praise people that they condemn and condemn people that they praise and things like that. And that's a real issue. There's, um, but the general scrape from the structural liturg liturgy in these two cases is very, very close. There is, however, historically, and this is important to point out, a single liturgical shibboleth that really is an absolute shibboleth with the Syriacs. Um, especially, but I think, yeah, well, the cops do it too. Um, and that is that the non-Chalcedonian Patriarch of Antioch, Peter the Fuller, added to the Trisagian hymn, uh, who was crucified for us. So they say, holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, uh, who was crucified for us, have mercy on us. Mm. And this became an absolute shibboleth, that if you use this, you are not orthodox from the Chalcedonian point of view. And it, it's partially because there's an entirely different understanding of what the hymn does in that case. Okay. So from the orthodox perspective, it's a Trinitarian hymn. And from the non-Chalcedonian perspective, it's a Christological hymn. Ah, interesting. And to keep things going back to authority of councils, Council 81 of the Council in Trillo, the late 7th century council that is considered ecumenical um, by the Chalcedonian Orthodox churches that sort of fills in the canonical material for the 5th and 6th councils. But Canon 81 of the Council in Trillo excommunicates anyone who uses this edition. Hmm. So there's a canonical, uh, it's it just simply canonically not allowed uh, for Chalcedonian Orthodox to use this, even if it's not terribly difficult to understand how theologically someone's not really being a heretic by using it. Uh, now, with the other Chalcedonian or non-Chalcedonian churches that use uh, is, is it less familiar liturgies, uh, it's harder to talk about things. So I, I, the Ethiopian liturgy is very ancient and very unique, and I'm certainly not qualified to say anything intelligent about it. And uh, I've honestly, I've never seen a good detailed uh, Chalcedonian Orthodox appreciation or discussion or analysis of it. That's mm -hmm. something that someone uh, with knowledge of Gez and liturgics really needs to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it, it, it's beyond my knowledge. All that said, the case of the Armenians is particularly interesting because it had a lot of ramifications. So the Armenians also have their own unique liturgy that goes back to the beginning of Christianization of Armenia. Um, but they've always lived in close proximity both to Chalcedonians and to uh, non-Chalcedonian Syrians. And so uh, their very unique uh, practices have often caused a lot of friction with their neighbors. 
uh, and given rise to polemics. Um, one that's always polemicized against is a custom called Madah that is, uh, our Armenians give uh, Thanksgiving offerings. Uh, I mean, they slaughter animals on the steps of their churches. Hmm. And by both other non-Chalcedonians and by Chalcedonians, this was considered wildly beyond the pale. Not even on theological grounds, it just seems like intuitively something you would never do in a church. Um, but uh, the more significant liturgical issue with the Armenians, historically speaking, is that they use unleavened bread. Um, so on the Chalcedonian side, uh, polemic against this practice by the Armenians predates uh, uh, polemic against uh, Latin use of azymes. And a lot of the arguments used against azymes in the uh, Great Schism were just cut and pasted from earlier polemics against Armenians. Uh, and really interesting, on the non-Chalcedonian side, so where when the Armenians came into um, sort of, uh, well, Cilicia, so the area between southern Anatolia and, and Syria, in the 10th and 11th centuries, you start seeing uh, rejections of azymes among Coptic and Syriac patriarchs when they would be enthroned. So when a patriarch is enthroned, he writes what's called a synodical letter, stating his stating sort of a short creed of what he believes to be recognized or to have his orthodoxy recognized by the other patriarchs. And the non-Chalcedonians did this too between their patriarch of Antioch and the patriarch of uh, Alexandria. But you start seeing them. These are written in Arabic because that's their language of communication between them. Uh, but one of the things, in addition to, you know, giving a insistence on one nature language about Christ, they say, and we condemn anyone who uses azimes. And this goes on for a few centuries before uh, Armenian practice came to be accepted even among the other non-Calcedonians. So it's um, the the variety of practices um, has historically been a problem. So I'm going to ask a question now on behalf of the laity, which may drive you up the wall. But which is me too. I'm, it, it's I'm completely the laity. <laughs> well, but you're you're smart. So the uh, uh, from our standpoint, from the non-academic standpoint, let's put it that. Yep. All we want to know is what do our brothers and sisters in the non-Chalcedonian Church have to do to get back in communion with us. And that's, I know it's going to sound simplistic, but can you at least help us understand what do we, what do we want? Well, I think that that's, well, uh, not a, it's a difficult question for me to answer because I'm a lay person. I mean, this is really a question for not just a bishop, but a group of bishops. And it, it really has to be figured out in a uh, pastoral and conciliar way by Chalcedonian bishops. Okay. It, it it can't be left to academics. I mean, I, I think that academics have produced some good and some very bad things about this. Um, and it, it can't really be left in the hands of academics. And uh, so instead of say, well, what I'll say is that I think that the Joint Commission uh, in the 70s and 80s had some serious problems uh, that were kind of structural to it. And it, I, I think that now is a good time to restart, maybe set aside that work, which I think is very problematic, and take a more realistic uh, perspective on it. So one of the problems in the Joint Commission was that one of the um, members of it on the Chalcedonian side was Father John Romanides. And Father Romanides was fanatically anti-Latin. Just almost, he almost built his own whole personality around being against the Latins. And so he uh, went out of his way to downplay the importance of the Tome of Leo, to downplay the importance of the fact that um, the Council of Chalcedon was able to incorporate Latin theological traditions alongside Alexandrian and Antiochian traditions. Um, and he basically, he, he wanted to throw that part of our tradition under the bus. And that's, I, I, from my perspective, not necessarily as a scholar, but as a believer, I find that unacceptable. Um, 
another issue, and this is always a problem uh, when dealing with the non-Calcedonians, is that um, there's a tendency among the Calcedonians to patronize them in the same way that Rome sometimes patronizes the Chalcedonians. Mm. They say, oh, yes, you're a fine relic from our past, but we have some developments and you don't. And th so in the Joint Commission's things, there was a tendency to talk about the non-Chalcedonians as ho holding a kind of pre-Chalcedonian theology. Uh, so there was very little interest in finding out what's actually being taught in uh, their churches uh you know in practice yes. but rather to take them as kind of a historical relic um that was part of our own past and we can incorporate in that way uh and I'll, uh, here's an example of one of the most difficult things that i'm familiar with again being only familiar with arabic language discourse um is the problem of uh the late pope shenouda's rejection of theosis hmm. And even though Pope Shenouda obviously uh, held to the non-Chalcedonian uh, formula of one incarnate nature, the in practice, his rejection of uh, theosis went around and was functionally Nestorian. That is, he believed that humanity and divinity are wholly incompatible and could not exist in the and cannot exist in the same being. And he he considered he called. Um, the idea of theosis shirk, which means mm. was the Muslim theological term for associating what's not God with God, mm. which is a Muslim uh, criticism of the incarnation. So I think really, and this is sort of aside from this, that aside from any discussion of Chalcedon as such, for any kind of ecumenical progress to be made with the Coptic Church, they have a responsibility to make it unambiguously clear that Shenouda's writings on theosis are wholly accept unacceptable, uh, not just you know in Chalcedonian terms, but in historical non-Chalcedonian terms. I mean, they're they're simply heretical by the standards of the theology of Cyril of Alexandria. That is the whole point of Cyril's theology, uh, which is the Christological gold standard for both them and us, is that the Incarnation made theosis possible for humankind. Chalcedonians can't compromise on that, but neither can non-Chalcedonians if they want to stay true to their tradition. So I think this, the, there are fewer now supporters of Shinoda's, Shinoda's position within the Coptic Church, but there is great reticence to criticize him directly uh, among the Copts because of his sort of larger than life importance in, in, in their church. Yeah. And, but I, 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 if they actually don't believe in theosis, um, then I don't think any further conversation is possible. Mm. And if they allow a very strong, whether Nestorian or Islamic rejection of theosis, um, to, to pass by without comment, then I don't think we can have theological conversations with them. So, Dr. Noble, for many years you've been studying and translating Arabic into English, particularly as it relates to theological documents. So, just thinking about theosis from a Coptic perspective, we've heard that the word theosis can be problematic in the Arabic language in Muslim environments. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, you know, the uh, Coptic Church is not the only arabic speaking church by any means uh there's both you know non-chalcedonian uh, arabic speakers and chalcedonian arabic speakers and within a chalcedonian context the term theosis has had a very long life in arabic uh ta'allu or uh, ta'li uh and if you look at uh the medieval translations of greek patristic texts for example that start to be translated in the ninth century uh you find theosis this word ta'allu ta'li um in the texts you find it in ottoman era um uh, theological texts and translations from the Greek, and it's extremely common, of course, in uh, modern Chalcedonian Orthodox discourse in Syria and Lebanon and the Holy Land. So there's, at least in the experience of the Chalcedonian churches, which exist also in Egypt, uh, 
that there's never been worry that this term would cause problems uh, or misunderstandings with Muslims. Uh, I mean, and if you think about it in practice, for Muslims, the incarnation is scandal enough. I mean, uh, the doctrine of theosis doesn't create any more scandal because already this shirk, this uh, you know, ontological union between God and man happens in the incarnation. And, you know, so there's never really been a problem. In, in you can see, uh, though, how um, the Coptic Church has, when they're reacting to the doctrine of theosis, they have their own internal discourses and uh, debates in language that would be unfamiliar to a, a Chalcedonian Orthodox audience, but they're also reacting to Arabic publications uh, by Chalcedonian Orthodox authors about uh, theosis. And their reaction to these, uh, well, very run-of-the-mill, straightforward uh, Chalcedonian Orthodox texts uh, has been very, very harsh. Mm. So in 2007, for example, the Coptic of the Holy Synod of the Coptic Orthodox Church condemned uh, a book entitled Orthodoxy, a Creed for Today, by Father Anthony Coniaris, who's familiar uh, to many, many people in North America. Um, and uh, I mean, th they condemned it for its kind of straightforward uh, popularizing explanation of theosis. Uh, another example that's quite serious um, in terms of its ec ecumenical uh, repercussions is that um, also in the early 2000s, a uh, book entitled Theosis, the Purpose of Life, which uh, was written by Archimandrite George Capsanis, who was abbot of the monastery of Gregorio on Mount Athos, uh, was translated into Arabic. And this was an official publication of the Greek Orthodox metropolis of Jordan in the uh, Patriarchate of Jerusalem. Now, this book has many, is, is again a kind of straightforward explanation of theosis according to St. Gregory Palamas and other Holy Fathers. Uh, and when this translation came into the uh, hands of Anba Bishoy, the uh, Coptic Metropolitan of Damietta, who was really one of the most powerful and influential figures in the Coptic Church during his lifetime. Uh, he passed away in 2018. Uh, Anba Bishoy wrote a scathing uh, rebuke of this book. It was even longer than the book itself. They're, I mean, they're both uh, fairly short, you know, uh, somewhere between a booklet and, you know, something like that. And in uh, Anba Bishoy's book against uh, Archimandrite Kapsanis' book, he uh, states very, very clearly that grace is only created, that the divine energies are not God, there cannot be divine human communion uh, on the basis of the divine energies. And, you know, he doesn't use the sort of Islamizing um, rhetoric that Pope Shenouda used, but instead he uses a very straightforward um, rejection of theosis that, uh, in many ways, um, is identical to some Western uh, rejections of theosis. That is, grace is only created, in his view. Uh, and so, the the Coptic rejection of theosis, at least as it was articulated by Pope Shenouda and Anba Bishoy, is very much directed at uh, Chalcedonian Orthodox uh, understandings of divine human communion. The final thing that the dialogue failed at quite badly was that it went out of its way to avoid dealing with the question of Christ's will and activity. That is, as we discussed, um, yeah. the Chalcedonian Orthodox believe that will and activity pertain to nature, understood as something common and not to person. Um, so, nature, or so will, in our technical language about will, is not something that an indi that is specific to an individual, but rather is specific to a nature. Uh, 
So the way that the dialogue talked about will is, and I'll, I'll quote it here, both families agree that he who wills and acts is always the one hypostasis of the Logos incarnate. Now, this is fine, of course. I mean, it's a totally orthodox statement. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's an affirmation of this single subject Christology, that there's not two Christs, there's not a divine and a human acting separately. It's fine as it, it, it's fine as it goes, but the danger here, if you don't accept the theology of Maximus the Confessor, which was made mandatory for Chalcedonians at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, uh, is that it's very hard to avoid one of two things. So either Christ's personal will is distinguishable from the will of God the Father. And then implicitly, each hypostasis of the Trinity would have its own will. And everybody agrees that's absurd. I don't think non calcedonians think that any more than anyone does. Or that you have to say that Christ has a divine will uh, only. Hmm. And in addition to create, creating great problems for biblical exegesis, you know, the agony in the garden becomes very hard to interpret as anything other than play acting. Um, it brings us back around to something that's quite close to actual Eutychian monophysitism. So if there's going to be unity, we cannot avoid of talking about the problem of how uh, Maximus's theology can be rendered in an acceptable way in language, or rendered in uh, language acceptable to non-Chalcedonians. Um, that is, can one nature language uh, get us there and avoid these problems? And I, I think that's never really been clarified. And it is impossible to say that we have an identity of faith yeah. without uh, addressing this issue. It's actually very helpful. I appreciate that. Well, let's end on a on a positive note here and talk about the appropriate ways that we might cooperate with our non-Chalcedonian brothers and sisters. I know there are seminarians who go to St. Vlad's and St. Tikhon's. Uh, what other ways can you think of where we might be able to work together, at least to get to know each other a little better? Well, yeah, well this is sort of the advantage of the uh, North American and Western European diaspora, although it's also similar to the Middle East in some ways, in that, uh, well, there are many places where non-Calcedonians and Calcedonians come into contact and have opportunities to, um, well, get to know each other and see each other's prayer lives and to realize that our monastic lives, especially uh, for the Copts, I would say, um, and our uh, liturgical lives and our prayer lives are familiar to each other. I mean, familiar sort of upon immediate contact. And this is very valuable. And this is, I think, the uh, strongest driving reason to deal with these hideously complex um, philosophical problems. So there's that. And there's also, you know, when I was listing off to you the uh, places where there are, um, where the non calcedonians have churches um, outside of, you know, in, in, in their home countries, all of these places, uh, whether it's Syria and Lebanon, whether it's the Holy Land, whether it's Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, which has had quite a horrible civil war in their Christian heartland in the north, uh, Eritrea, where the government har harshly persecutes the church, or Armenia, which is currently um, under existential threat from Azerbaijan. The, the, these are all places where the Christians are in need. So if, if as we're making an effort to become more familiar with them, both in a personal way and in these more abstract kind of intellectual ways, it's really important to remember that these are very ancient communities that are under serious existential threats. Mm -hmm. And that whether through charitable giving, whether through you know, awareness things, whether through political action, um, if we say that we have a special affection for them, which we should, we also need to find ways to take action to make sure that these communities continue to exist in their homelands. Mm. 
Very good word. Thank you for that. And thank you, Dr. Sam Noble, Ph.D. in Religious Studies from KU Leuven and is a visiting researcher at the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations at Aga Khan University in London. Dr. Noble, you've been incredibly helpful and informative today, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you.